Welcome from Las Vegas, Nevada, the host city of NAB 2014. We're here on the 45th floor of the Trump International Hotel. This is Cinema 5D on the couch. Presented by b &H, the professional's source. Vitech Videocom, Tools on Air, and Zeiss. Welcome to another episode of Cinema 5D on the Couch. Today we have four distinguished independent filmmakers with us. The Bui brothers, Wu and Lan. Yeah. And then we have Jan and Christoph from the Wienerland web series. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about your different projects. But first of all, let's watch some clips from your upcoming web series. Fortified our spirit. We know what honor means. In blood, we become chosen. The revolution is coming. I'm not letting them get away with this. You really are crazy, aren't you? You think you're gonna take down this entire city by yourself? Dude, that was great. Yeah, thank you. That was good stuff. <laughs> really excited about it. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah, no, we tried our best. So now we have actually. Yeah, well, what, what is it all about? It's a, you, you told me it's a spaghetti western Yeah, we call the whole series? genre a spaghetti fantasy because our approach is to do uh, 
fantasy series, but not a classic fantasy. We won't have any knights, probably no dragons. Uh, it should be more fantasy for, for grown-ups with a little twist, so it's, it's a brutal, rough world. And our whole setting is like, I don't know, if you think of Middle-earth, 2000 years later, technology-wise, um, that's, that's probably the story I want to tell. And hopefully you can get a little feeling with the teaser that we just saw. So you guys uh, shot in 4K. My my dear friend Johnny, also Cinema 5D partner, was your DP on the on the teaser. Yes, he was. Um, how, how did it turn out? I mean, you, we talked a little bit beforehand about the 4K. How do you like it? Is it necessary? Um, in the beginning, I said I don't want to shoot it in 4K because I love the C300 and I plan to shoot the whole project on the C300. And Johnny insisted on using the 1DC because he fell absolutely in love with it. Um, yeah, I was a little skeptical in the beginning, but as it turned out, it's really saved our ass because we shot, we had three night shoots in November. It was freaking cold. Uh, it was raining, which was probably my fault because the first word uh, I wrote in my screenplay was heavy rain. <laughs> and then when I it's thought about it. It's probably your fault. Yeah, yeah this is your fault. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, maybe, how, how are we going to do that? Because we had no budget for the teaser. and. I said, okay, maybe we are lucky and it's not going to rain. Of course, as soon as we started shooting, it poured down. And so we lost, I think maybe okay. like we had, uh, yeah, actually we lost the whole day. Um, and I planned like 25 setups, which is actually could be okay for an independent production, but a night shoot in November, 25 is a lot. And we, I think we got like 11. So, um, and that's where 4K, as I said, saved our asses because we actually had wide shots, a uh, master, and that was it. So we also shot with a 12 year old boy. And he, I mean, he was really tough and he's a very, very professional, but it was like 1.30 at night, so he got tired and we said, okay, it's raining, it's cold. We got the master shot. We had three takes of that and then it just started pouring down again. So I had one master for the whole opening scene as you saw. I mean, not the animation side, but the, the other stuff. And without 4K, yeah, um, it wouldn't be that interesting. I mean, I hope that you think it is interesting <laughs> the way it is right now. So it, so it helped you with reframing and everything, but was it harder? I mean, was it was it useful for the special effects or, or did it make the also the normal, like the makeup more harder? Because it, the makeup needs to be much better in 4K, right? Well, the, the, the hard thing is the computing power, of course, because everything takes longer in 4K. But we could do drives, and moves and zooms, which helped us a lot, of course. On the other hand, you have to do the 3D renderings in 4K sometimes if you, if you want to go with the camera. But it helped, of course, yeah. We it's didn't tell our makeup department that no. we shoot in 4K, no. so that's why. What we actually did is, is we, we animated the makeup parts, especially the orc, to have some movement in the face afterwards, which, which helped a lot. But you could have done that, in, done that in HD too, of course. Cool. So you were with motion trackers on the face? or No, no, no. We, we didn't plan it. But the, the, the main part, the nose part, is very rigid, of course, on the makeup. So we just walked it a little bit to make the, the eyes move and the eyebrows move, which helped to make it more living. It was very believable. Yeah, yeah it looks mm -hmm. great. Thank you very much. And you can't so even tell that you guys had those issues of missing shots. like. With using, yeah, actually, using I mean, you, if you know, or if you knew what I actually planned and the way it turned <laughs> out, but that's the yeah. thing. I mean, it's always that's the same not as a that's viewer, not a viewer, you know, because yeah. we watched it as viewers. As a viewer, you don't know any of that. So when we watch it, it's fresh. We don't see all the missing pieces that you guys see. So the it's, thing it's is, nice. um, when I started the project, I thought about, uh, and that's also my approach. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I thought about their opening sequence. It's yeah. like two guys on one side, one guy on the other side, dual scene, and then they just run into the. I, don't, I mean, I think you know the good, yeah. the bad. Yeah, yeah, okay. Actually, script wise, there's nothing going on except for those guys. So, okay, so that was our influence for the, for the teaser. And, now, and then what's missing is the dual scene. I mean, it's like three or four seconds now in the finished version because. I just didn't have the shots. Yeah. We had no moving shots. I had one wide shot with three guys walking in and I used it for close-up of the feet, close-up of his feet, close-up of his face, close-up of his belly. So, and yeah, that was the 4K thing. So 
if we shoot the whole series, and I hope that we can make that in this fall, uh, we'll probably stick to 4K just to make sure. But the, the reason that I actually don't like it is um, that you kind of get lazy. I mean, Johnny kept talking, hey, don't be lazy. I mean, you know how Johnny talks, and he's so precise, and it took him to our DOP. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, we just do the framing that you imagined and not anything else. Because I was, okay, it's 4K, we can zoom in, let's <laughs> roll. <with> the, <laughs> That's I not mean, what a DP wants to hear. Yeah, I, mean, I know, I know. <laughs> but I mean, if it's three o'clock in the morning and you've got a 12 year old and you've got a chicken yeah. and you've got the, the, the animal trainer, and she, I mean, we booked her from, I think, from nine to 11. <laughs> so we started shooting with the chicken at one th- thirty, uh, something like, like that. And then I said, okay, just shoot that chicken. I mean, not shoot the chicken, but shoot yeah, the well chicken. And shoot the chicken. And shoot the chicken. <laughs> but actually, we shot it, it afterwards. Originally, it was planned that the chicken survived. No survived. animals were harmed, at least in this. Yeah, that's production. true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the chicken is still alive, but and it, I wanted it to survive the whole story, or the, this part at least. But then we said, okay, um, no, the, the, the story was the thing that's, that's missing for me is a proper introduction of the two bounty hunters. It's the orc and the dwarf. And I, I mean, I imagined the shot with the, I mean, yeah, yeah, spaghetti fantasy, you need a little stylish introduction. And right now they're just walking into the frame like yeah. nothing. And we said, okay, maybe we can give them a little more personality if we kill a chicken. So the chicken, yeah, died. Poor chicken. I'm sorry about that. His role was short lived. Yeah. effects artist. I had to do it afterwards. It wasn't yeah. planned. So. Yeah, of course. <laughs> cool in 4K. Easier to, to yeah. change stuff. But, uh, you know, go back to the makeup thing that you were bringing up. Like, if your output is going to be HD, then, then that, at least that part of it is yeah. less worrisome But yeah, about yeah. seeing those details because your output is going to be HD and the viewers are going to see it in HD, so they're not going to see the flaws in the makeup as well. Yeah, I mean, so you guys shoot a lot of stuff as well. I mean, you shot a feature film recently, yes. but it, it wasn't shot in 4K. Why not? Why not? C300. C300 at HD because... Mostly because of the workflow. We had a really small crew as an independent film, and a lot of the money and a lot of the effort went into getting bigger stars. So Danny Trejo is in it, a couple other guys that are notable guys are in it. And, you know, instead of spending the money on other things like shooting 4K, we spent it on getting actors and crew and that kind of stuff. Also, shooting 4K wasn't really a necessity in any way for the film. So there was no reason to even consider it. Yeah, even if it was an option, I would have decided to not shoot it in 4K, especially because we had, you know, we were shooting 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. every single day mm-hmm. for three weeks straight. So it was, it was a, lot of, a lot of shooting. We're shooting tons of stuff. And just the data involved alone would have just backlogged us. We didn't have the staff to support that. So, And our final output, we, we premiered it in the Chinese theater in Hollywood. And oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Right. It was a to, month ago. It was so cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> Red carpet and everything. I mean, I think the only reason to shoot in 4K with Danny Trejo is his face. Yeah. 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 That, yeah, yeah. That's but even yeah. HD, like, that. like I remember <laughs> when, uh, was it uh, Once Upon a Time in Mexico, right? He yeah. shot that in HD and that was the big deal that everyone was talking about. It's that you, his face yeah. looks so amazing in HD. Now we're talking about that same face in 4K, yeah. right? Like at, at some point, you know, you're not gaining much resolution for the viewer. You're gaining resolution yeah. in your files yeah. and all of that, but the viewer is not going to see more right. than a certain amount unless they're viewing at not a proper distance. And, I mean, our actress, she's 35, 30-something years old. Are you supposed to tell and, that? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no hopefully she doesn't Screen see age, this. 15, um, she's been 29 for, for she, seven years. I mean, she's a beautiful exactly. girl, but then, you know, shooting in HD, we had Zeiss glass, everything was so crisp and clear. I'm always diffusing, diffusing, diffusing the light because we didn't have a huge lens package. I sent us a package of lenses and that's all we had for the whole shoot. And so I couldn't, I didn't have a chance to go get some old lenses, nice, soft, old, cool looking lenses. But It's funny that you mentioned that because we had Zeiss here. They are one of our sponsors and we talked a lot about technical detail and how they develop their lenses. Yeah. And uh, they are after perfect you know precision it should yeah. be as sharp as possible because yeah. because they say you can do everything afterwards in yeah. post you can always make stuff yeah, less can. sharp which yeah. is true you can take away you can't put yeah. in detail that's not yeah. but there. yesterday we talked to rodney here on the couch and he's like well i don't need sharpness you know i want character in the lens yeah. so i think there's a lot of different position of dps on this yeah. because i mean also very often right now and that's the problem that dps like rodney or bruce have mm-hmm. uh, working on these big shows um 
they get they don't get paid to be involved with the post production, so yeah. they lose control after they leave the set. Yeah, yeah so they so want to get it right. They want to have the look in yes. camera as much as possible. Yeah. And the cropping in that you mentioned, I mean, obviously, I mean, Johnny wasn't happy, but at the end, he might have been happy because otherwise, he would have ended with. I think nothing. he liked it, yeah. yeah. You, you wouldn't have <laughs> what you just showed. But still, I mean, he, yeah. as a DP, you want control over over what it is. But the same with the lenses. I mean, uh, yeah, we just add looks and everything, yeah. and yeah. I, 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 go ahead. I feel like I'm realistic though with the whole workflow thing. So on this film, I was barely involved with the color sessions because I got very busy and there were just other issues going on. Like you guys had a lot of issues on this film. There were, there's always a lot of issues and that was one of the things I couldn't attend some of the color timing sessions or even some of the editing, which I'm not really usually that involved in, but it was, it would have been nice to be there for some of the shots that were better shots and you know, the way that the director and I envisioned it, the director wasn't there for some of the editing too. And it's like the director and the DP, we had this vision for a few of the shots and then they didn't make it into the final edit. And it's like, those are a lot of challenges that you kind of just have to be like, okay, that's the way that it is. You know, the film got sold. So just be happy with what happened. And in reality, we just show the trailer, so. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for, for, for DP, I think it, it's, it, it should be important for us to regain some of that control, yeah. uh, which is hard because yeah. it's Especially not when we're not doing everything in camera anymore. Yeah. Exactly. You know, so I bought a Leica Monochrome, which is, has a beautiful, very sharp sensor. They've removed the bare layer, or the bare filter, so you're getting a lot of sharpness out of that sensor. And I tried it out with the new Leica lenses and it was too much. Yeah. So I went and bought old 50 year old lenses and it kind of like tones it down just a little. Yeah. And although I, I do all the post processing on my own photographs, it's like I can imagine in situations where a DP doesn't get to be involved in post, wanting to have that control, you're gonna do everything you can to make it look good in the camera. Also, the DP has a relationship with their actors, and when Rodney talks about these aging actresses being unhappy being shot that way, they want him to make them look good. Yes. And so but he in has camera, to get that because right. Because that's yeah. the only way they you can don't make know sure what, exactly. it end, ends up being that way in yeah, the Yeah, because you don't product. know what the, the editors are going All to the do. Producer, what the, yeah, yeah, you don't know what their vision is. And if your relationship is with the actress and like, I, I want to make you look good, or actors, you know, depending on what people want to look like, you have to do that in camera as best as you can. Exactly. I think um, there's a good market for these post-production houses that, you know, they have a lot of troubles with replacing the business they lost through uh, film development. Yeah. So I met this company in Austria, the uh, Synchro Film. They, do, they did a lot of 35 millimeter production, uh, like yeah. development scanning and that kind of stuff. That's going away. But they're trying to replace that business with a, a new smart idea they had. Uh, they have an on-set uh, color grading suite so they drive there with a car, everything is set in there, it's perfect, it's perfectly calibrated, it has all the backup, it's DIT as well, so it's basically you go there, after the shoot, they shot a whole series, a TV series in Austria on Ari Raw, I think, or was it, no, it was ProRes 4444. I'm sorry, which one was that? That was um, uh, Soko Dono. They shot Soko Dono on Ari. Yeah, they, they shot it on, <laughs> <laughs> they, shot it, they shot it on Ari. Uh, Pro Let's not talk about the content, yeah, okay. but, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they <laughs> TV, uh, <laughs> Austrian TV. But they took um, they took the cards to that bus uh, and uh, the DP, and they they intentionally uh, put the, put it together in a way that only the DP could sit there with the colorist. They didn't want there to be more space, yeah, because otherwise. All these people go there, yeah. the director goes All there, the producer goes there, and input. give their five cents to everything. Yeah, yeah. And so nobody sees any of the footage before the DP doesn't sit with the colorist uh, over the dailies at the end of the day and go through them and then they screen it. Yeah. I think that's a pretty smart idea and that I think that's awesome. a big, a great business model, especially, you know, I mean, it's probably hard for DPs to, to negotiate something like that, mm, yeah, yeah. but I think it also saves so much time in post-production because mm -hmm. when you do that right on set, you're just faster. If mm -hmm. you just do that right after the shoot, you just, you just shot this scene, you know exactly which one is good, you know the, the ones that are copied and transferred and you can immediately do a pre-grade and you know even an assembly edit 
on set. So, so that's the, the key is there, you know, if a DP wants to be able to have that control, that they're selling the right points, right? When you're selling this to producer or whoever you need to do that, you're selling the efficiency, you're selling the cost savings in post and all of that, and not the fact that, oh, we also want to keep you out of this van, yeah. you know? And like, if you do it right, you'll be able to convince people of the, the true merits of it that, that will also benefit you in other ways. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about financing indie projects. You guys have a lot of, a lot of, but yes. some so money. Can you so tell much? Us like how 30 to do it? years. <laughs> yeah, of, uh, you have some experience. Money, it's also okay. <laughs> <laughs> tell us how I get it. You can co produce. I, mean, yeah, I have a little bit of money in my wallet. <laughs> yeah. um, about two dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's two minutes. No, but you, you, did a lot of, you did a lot of talks for Nikon, I think, at the, mm -hmm. at the NAB. Yeah. So, about that topic. Yeah. Yep. One of our talks was called. Uh, how do you book your first hundred thousand dollar shoot? Yeah. So I guess we should know something. Yeah. Well, give us give us the gist of that. <laughs> well, it it all comes down to relationships. Like if you look at a a producer and it's a producer that's finding money, not not just someone that just has a lot of money, but someone that's acting as your producer, finding money for your projects. That person should have a lot of connections. They should have a lot of people that they know and know how to pull those people together and know how to get people excited. And that's something that Vu and I, whenever we produce projects that we want money for, it's on us to use our relationships that we've built over the years and see who would be a right fit for the projects that we need money for. And like for like the specifically for what we were talking about, it was a commercial. It was a, a, um, a travel commercial for a tripod and they actually approached us after we did basically some free work for another guy who was doing work for them. And he needed some videos made. We did a bunch of videos for them. The client ended up really liking the videos. They came to us, asked us to do some stuff, and that's a relationship that actually spawned out like that. Now, relating that to if you have a, project, a passion project that you want to build, I can say that's a lot harder than someone just walking up and saying, oh, what do you guys got? What can I put money into? So it's finding the right, like sometimes it's the right brands but to if come they, in. But if they put money into it, how is there, I mean, because we thought about it a lot and we discussed mm -hmm. it for, I don't know, maybe six months now. I mean, my planned route is, is crowdfunding yeah. and to grow with the audience and then maybe, I don't know, find a way to shoot the uh, season one, which should be feature length uh, when you put all the yeah. episodes together. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, grow with the audience and maybe increase the budget for season two. Yeah. But if we uh, don't think about crowdfunding and investors, I want to stay in online. I mean, I want to show it on YouTube. I want to show it for free. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I haven't figured out the model to how investors could be interested in it. If it's not a vanity thing, if yeah. they say, hey, look, I'm an, I got my IMDb yeah. credit and now I'm a producer. Yeah. So how, I don't know, how do you get investors? Or what, how could they get money back if you don't have a theatrical release? Is it just video on demand or is it? Or video on demand is part of it. Okay. And, you know, also depending on the audience that you're able to build, <laughs> like the, you know, people really underestimate how much people are making on YouTube mm -hmm. via AdSense and the ads on there. You know, the top YouTubers, the ones with, you know, 10 million subscribers, they're pulling in five, six or more million per year. These are 21 year olds, a lot of them, you know, these are young guys, but there's a lot of money out there. And, you know, our whole talk was about relationships. I mean, that was everything. Relationships is everything. And now you guys are already doing this project. Okay, so you don't have time to go and develop 10 year long relationships with people who will bring that to um, you. No. But like, uh, sorry, no, no, sorry. Uh, I really believe in crowdfunding. I think that this is one of the best things. A lot of people say it's the worst thing to ever happen. I think it's one of the best things to ever happen for filmmakers and independent creatives, not just in film and photography, but across the board, because you're allowing the audience to buy into it before you've even made it, right? Obviously, you have to prove that you can make it. That's part of the entire process for Kickstarter. But, but they've done that already. They have done yeah. that already. And like, because. you have to, you know, you, you, you have something to show, you have a plan, you have everything there, you know, allowing people who, those are the people that you want to invest because they're the ones who want to watch it, yeah. as opposed to someone that else. Audience, yeah. Like, that's why Danny Trejo is in our film, because he is a name that internationally is recognized. Yeah. And our film would not have sold unless that character was somebody famous. And so part of it was finding the right person to play that role. The, the producers, they found a number of different actors to try and fill that role. 
and looked at mainly what their following was. And not just their following, but okay, are they an international seller? Or are they just US? How many Twitter followers? How many people are on Facebook? All of that was taken into consideration. And are they the active hiring. doing yeah, that they stuff? Active? You yeah. know, like do they promote their own projects? Yeah. Like that kind of stuff really matters when you're trying to drum up an audience. Yeah. You can't always do all the promotion yourself, especially if you don't already have a big following. So pulling people in who can do that and not like, oh, I'm gonna pay you so that you'll promote my project, but pulling them in as some right. sort of involvement where they are genuinely invested in the project, maybe not with money, but maybe Maybe with some sort of creative degree or cameos or something. Or like Danny, you know? our film is he has the most lines he said on set. He's like, I have the most lines in this movie than I've had since the 80s. I don't know if that's <laughs> truly accurate. Because he's Danny Trejo. Yeah. So he is Danny Trejo. He doesn't but say much. I think we could find a role for him in being alone. Yeah. <laughs> so Danny, but please. could fit in. No, but um, coming back to your relationship things, I mean, you're, I agree 100%, but for me, I mean, I've been in the business for uh, 14 years now, I build my relationships, so uh, crew-wise, I find the right people yeah. to work with them, I, equipment, I mean, I could I could talk to people and they could support us with equipment, with the lighting set, with mm -hmm. the camera, we actually don't really need it because we got it, mm -hmm. um, even with actors, but that's a problem for us now because we, um, I know name actors in Austria mm -hmm. and some maybe in Germany, but Nobody gives a shit in the States. Yeah. So that's one thing. But if you if I go the crowdfunding route, I think the, the Austrians still don't have the, the right mentality. Mm. I mean, it's, it's hard for us to get Facebook likes. Yeah. My, my, I got like 1,500 Facebook friends and maybe 250. And the problem is that right now Facebook is really, you know, limiting the reach of these yes. pages. Yeah. So you now only have, if it's you don't really, pay yeah. for advertising, yeah. you get only like a fraction of that a very people. Very small fraction. So it's and it's yeah. decreasing. But, yeah. Yeah. But the I'm sorry, just, that just to let me finish that. Yeah. Uh, but if I don't even get to like my fan page, how would I get them to, to invest some money? Yeah, yeah. And it's, and they're still, I think a little, I, I mean, I, you know the Austrian mentality or Europeans, they are not as easily involved in the project and they just don't want to show or put their credit number, yeah, yeah. credit card number into it. So now I said, okay, Kickstarter would be our platform. Mm -hmm. I think you can find enough crazy guys who are fantasy fans who like the project, who could support us. Uh, who get, I don't know, nice merchandising or, or perks that everybody likes and they would invest, but then I'd need an American name actor or somebody. Yeah, you, I mean, well, even, not necessarily. Even name actor, you could look at, you know, in the same genre of fantasy, there are people that are just well known. So YouTube people that make content around that area that have big followings, those are people to approach too. And not necessarily for money, but to bring the audience yeah. that will yeah. you know, funded. If, and then the other place to get money are, if you have good relationships with manufacturers, something that is very easy to do is say, hey, we just need a few thousand dollars. It's not asking them for 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 dollars, it's a couple thousand and you just promise them, okay, we're gonna feature you in our behind the scenes. And those are things that manufacturers, that's a tiny part of their mm. advertising budget or marketing budget for them to say, oh, there's another thing shot on this, or you know, they use these lights, or they yeah. use these things. That's and they the other usually part want real, do, real projects being shown. You know. yeah. yeah, they wanna see real good yeah. work and so, being done with their stuff, and that's the other big part of our talks. We have one part that's really all about relationships, and the other is about behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Behind the scenes is something, usually it's like the last thought in people's minds when they're putting a project together. So they only have some footage on set, maybe they brought someone on to shoot it, but we do behind the scenes, even from concept phase and all of that kind of stuff, keeping your original drawings on napkins or whatever it is and keeping that. And then that's also media you get to share. Kickstarter supporters really love having access to like a private blog that can later become yeah. public. But during production, you have a production log with videos behind the scenes, all that kind of stuff. And that is stuff that adds value to the project outside of just the final works. So you then open your audience you know, your funding audience to not just fans of the genre, but to also your peers and other filmmakers who are like, well, yeah, I want to see how they do this stuff, you know? And that actually can really help with the funding, getting guys like that, like, wow, these guys, obviously their stuff is amazing. I would love to learn from them. You know, some of the perks can involve that type of stuff too. And then you have other filmmakers funding your project as well. Yeah, I mean, that's actually uh, the second big half of, um, of my plan, because I want to I want to not only make a making offer behind the scenes, so it's, I just want to document the whole journey mm -hmm. and how we did it, 
and if we get support, um, manufacturer wise, if we get supporters, also feature them because I can also reach their audience mm -hmm. then. And so yeah. I can, I mean, our main thing right now is just grow the audience and get it, yeah, get, yeah. <laughs> get Wienerland, the name out yes. there. Yes, Wienerland. But, yeah. yeah. And all the Americans will go, Wienerland? What's Wiener that for? Land. And the manufacturers go sausage like, Wienerland? Yeah, the, <laughs> the sausage land. Yeah, so the, as I said, that's our plan B. If it doesn't work out, then we shoot yeah. porn. But it, I, <laughs> what I think it is, is it's, it's, well, Bruce Hotter, it's not just yeah. about like finding <laughs> money Hotter. from one source. It's a small amount from manufacturers. It's some from this, some from that. Mm. And adding it all up, that's where, that's where you get your budget from. It's not just, okay, we're going to focus on Kickstarter and that's our entire budget is Kickstarter. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that if you run, run a crowdfunding campaign, that's really, that's a full-time job. Yeah, I it mean, is. while you do it, it's it really, and you have to plan it properly. I, I know so many projects that failed on Kickstarter because they didn't have, you, and you need an audience before that. And I, I think you guys do that quite well. With a, I mean, you, you, your project is now known in Vienna, in Austria, because people have heard of it. It's very, the footage is something you normally don't see so often, so that also sets it apart. There is a, there there's is a, a visual style. There is it. a visual style to it. There is, it, is, it is kind of distinct. And also, I think uh, there's a big, you know, built-in audience. Like in horror, horror genre has a lot of, has a big fan base, and I might, might be the case for this fantasy stuff. I think stuff as fantasy. Well. I mean, there are so many fantasy fans out there, and I think, and that's also one interesting factor for me is that it's, it's not a new genre, but it's just a new approach. Because I, I mean, I like to see or to watch an orc with a machine gun. So, yeah. and we, I don't know. I can't think of another project where they just, yeah, were like, two hundred years later, or it's just always a classic fantasy thing. Um, and yes, it's important and we try to grow our audience. Um, and I think we, I mean, we've done, we've done a pretty good job yeah. so far without releasing anything. And the reason why so many Kickstarter campaigns fail is they, I don't know, they just so show still frames like we want $1 million. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, um, I don't want, if I run a Kickstarter campaign, uh, campaign I, don't, I don't need the money for the equipment. Yeah. So, because the, I get the impression that like 25 to 30 percent of the campaigns, it's just independent filmmakers yeah. and they want to buy the red one or the red dragon or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I need hundred thousand dollars, then I buy my equipment and, can, and then I can start <laughs> shooting. But that's again from, for us, it's, I mean, I try to shoot the first season. So it should be 90 minutes creating a new world in a fantasy setting. My plan is to shoot it for $150,000. He is co-producing and he doesn't believe it. No, but I heard I the think, chuckle. Yeah, I think, <laughs> well, we can. I think that we can do it because I have all the equipment. All I need is actors, production design, yeah, sets. sets, costumes, and then we can raise the quality. Yeah. And if we somehow, I mean, as soon as you get going, of course, we, I don't know, maybe if, if we start a, a Kickstarter campaign and we, fa we fail, we can still shoot, I don't know, episode one on our own or episode two and, and keep try. growing and then try it again. So I think uh, Lana had kind of breezed past this, but I think it's really important. And there's still a, a fairly short window left where this is going to be possible. But, you know, uh, people are always looking to people in Hollywood and, and on television. But right now you have a lot of people on YouTube who have been making really successful content, but the most popular content on YouTube is typically not narrative content. Yeah. And a lot of these guys have been doing, you know, uh, various just simple on camera stuff or making fun of people, yeah. prank videos, all that kind of stuff. But what they really want to do is be acting. And they have a huge audience, a huge audience want, that wants to see them do all kinds of stuff. And right now is a time when brands are starting to see that and they're picking up these YouTubers and pulling them into their music videos and pulling them into ad campaigns. But there's still time where you would be able to reach out to them and say, hey, check out this project. We would love to have you on board. And they bring their entire audience and that audience will fund your campaign. It's not gonna work for that much longer because everyone's gonna start doing it. But right now it's still early in the stages for like popular YouTubers to be approached by this kind of project where it's something they wanna do. They wanna move on and become a more serious actor and not just be you know, an on-camera talent type person. And I think that if you guys could even pull in one or two, mostly they're Americans, but they're not all Americans. All the big YouTubers, there's you know, PewDiePie in Sweden and there's all these different guys all around the world 
And if you can reach out to them, get them interested in your project, which is probably likely, just knowing like the, the type of people who are spending a lot of type, time on YouTube and then seeing your project, I think it would be a great fit and it would bring their audience to you, which also brings their audience to your Kickstarter campaign. Okay. I think it's fun what you mentioned before with, uh, with the gear, because it, I, I completely agree. A lot of people are after you know, money on Kickstarter and want to finance you know their cameras or whatever with their it. own kit. and it's it's kind of offensive to everyone who's involved with a production because mm -hmm. usually you know they don't pay their people or don't yeah. pay them well and then they buy a camera with it or yeah. you know it's very easy to get gear cheap or for free if you have a cool project yeah you know if yeah. people come up to me and they want my camera gear or whatever for something really cool i give it to them or maybe i might even you know shoot it for them if it's really good um, but <laughs> I mean, usually, and, and there are a lot of people like this everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's really everywhere. And wherever you go, you have people with equipment who help out other mm -hmm. people. Yeah. We're Either practically a, a rental house. At a re <laughs> uh, free rental yeah. house. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, at a reduced price uh, for, for indie projects. Yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that's very normal. Be. And I, I guess if you can't get the equipment for free or, or for very little money, then maybe your project isn't that, right? So yeah. like maybe those There's are the projects indicators. that shouldn't be <laughs> successful. I, I don't, I mean, the problem is that a lot of people, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm admin of a Facebook group, Filmmakers Austria, it has around 9,000 members. It's really active, a lot of people yeah. post stuff there, but I think 90% of the people looking for, for, you know, help, they want stuff for free. Yeah. And this is a, a, the wrong mentality too. It is. You know, it's like, and it's not, it's not the equipment that bothers me, but having people on their projects for free, and very often it is, they are paid projects, you yeah. know. For some reason or another, they don't have a lot of money on those, or they don't want to spend it. But, you know, it's, it's, it is very fair if a student looks for, you know, crew and everything, and a lot of people will help out. But sometimes you have these productions where you're like, why should I do this for free? Yeah. And this kind and of they're making this, money off of it. And that yeah, and that's cruises for the other ones because they get a bad reputation yes. for the wrong reasons because they didn't do any wrong any, anything wrong. But those few who ask for favors for you know, although they get paid for it, they they kind of screw it for that, the others. That's the problem is when people are getting paid and ask for things for free from mm -hmm. others. Now, if it's a passion project and you know the goal isn't to make money from it pull in favors and you know people work for free and everyone gets paid the same, zero, right? But I do have a major problem with people who they are gonna make money, but they're not willing to pay other people. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone should get the, what they're worth out of you know, the work that they do. And if a project is gonna make $100,000 total, right? Like everyone should get a piece of that. Mm -hmm. And it should be you know, based on whatever they have brought to the table, you know, and not all of it goes to the creators and they're like, thanks guys for the free, you know, free help, free cameras, free work. And uh, that's where, you know, people are trying to pay people with exposure. It's exposure is not tangible. You can't eat exposure. You can't sleep under exposure, right? Like that's, that's not a sustainable model because it just doesn't work over time. And another important thing is um, I want my crew to be paid, even if it's yeah. a little amount. Yeah. So if I say, okay, I know you get, I don't know, maybe a thousand dollars per shooting day and we shoot for 10 days and I only have, I don't have 10, I'll give you yeah. five, something like that. But I think as a director, it's important because if they do you a favor, I, I mean, there are some situations where you just, it doesn't work out. Yeah. When we, yeah, we had complications as on every any crew or set and if i if they do me a favor i'm i'm just i can't tell them hey okay I, that doesn't work or just not that i want to fire them but it's just yeah. a, a different approach and sometimes you really need it you need control yeah, you yeah don't if have you're any paying control. someone yeah. then it's like well you're not doing your job yeah. and yeah. if you're getting a favor then it's like I know you're helping me out, but can you yeah. do it it's right? A, it's okay yeah. for a teaser <laughs> yeah. for a short project, but for a series, we yeah. have to produce in time. Mm -hmm. I can't have them wait two years for the first episode. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. I, that's what it makes more expensive. Yeah. Yeah? If you want to work with good people, they actually pay for working with you if they don't get paid. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they, you have to say no to a lot of projects, to a lot yeah. of paid projects, uh, you know, if, if to work for something like this. So yeah. that, that's what a lot of people forget, especially student filmmakers when they ask somebody more experienced to help out on their project. It's, it's usually, you know... And that again is why it's so important to, to focus on the, on the behind the scenes because if I have... I mean, everyone, every department is an artist and I want to feature them. Yeah. So if they create their own, I don't know, orc mask or whatever, makeup effects, visual effects, 
they are all working in the business and at least if they work for free, I have to feature them somehow. Yeah. I mean, it goes for us, it goes so far that I, I don't know, we got this, the, the location. It was, um, uh, what, uh, <laughs> what, I, don't, I don't even know what they're doing. But the guy, <laughs> the guy who owned the location said, okay, you can shoot there for only 500 euros. So it's about 750 or $600. Um, but my son loves Speedway. And I said, okay, yeah, and maybe we can shoot a little Speedway video. So I said, but, and I said, okay, I don't have the money for the production, but the only thing I can do is shoot. I mean, I do it for clients every week, and if I have to go and shoot a Speedway race, that's some kind of value for him. Yeah. And uh, now I gotta shoot a Speedway race. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that would be May first, one day after the premiere. But um, we got the location for three days, and he was supporting us and it was perfect everybody's happy yeah no, we do we did the same yeah, thing trade. Like it, in yeah. our in our talk we actually have a slide that's all about like uh, money isn't the only form of payment yeah. right like sometimes we've shot on projects where they couldn't actually afford our rates but we figured out some other way that they could pay us whether it be you know instead of them owning all the footage we own the footage and they're just licensing it which allows us to use that footage for other projects or you know there was a project where we wanted to make a documentary um, and we needed access to people that they had access to and so that access was part of the payment and that kind of stuff is ways that you can get creative with paying that you know it's more of a barter situation so everyone still gets value yeah. they're paid we, we, we it just may not be money <laughs> yeah, yeah. So not only a speed wave no, no. <laughs> what, what, what do you think <laughs> yeah what do you think about uh, kickstarter projects like film film projects they are just everywhere now i mean it started out few years ago and it was something new in the beginning yeah. most of them I mean, a lot of them were successful in the beginning and now it's just so many of them that yeah. it just makes it hard especially in comparison with you know other kickstarter projects which are product related because mm -hmm. the the easiest thing for people who make inexpensive smaller products which are you know affordable by you know like let's say 100 200 dollars maximum yeah. uh, they are easy to sell if they are good idea they're easy to sell on 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 kickstarter we had um, a guy from cinetics here the other day on the couch he did a, a, a motion control slider uh, which which hugely took off on, on on kickstarter i mean they were funded overfunded in the first day wow. and they still have around two weeks to run i think right now <laughs> wow. so this is this is really doing great and, and it's much easier for them but as filmmakers the problem, I think, is what, what do you offer people? In the beginning, a lot of people, you know, tried it with the producer credit for yeah. the top. You know, I, I think that doesn't work anymore yeah. because it's like it, it doesn't have any, any value if, if everybody does it. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can, as you mentioned, you can exclusive give them access things, to yeah. exclusive stuff like behind the scenes. But here's the question, how long does it stay exclusive? You know, of course, until yeah, that's someone deal. puts it online, or at some point, as a filmmaker, you also want to put it out there or mm -hmm. on the DVD and to show ev to everyone. Well, Veronica Mars is a good example of that, right? Veronica Mars was hugely successful at the time that it was funded, and maybe still now, it was the highest funded, you know, film project ever. And they offered all kinds of, you know, benefits. And I think one of the big mistakes that people make is not realizing how much they're going to lose out of the money they raise, mm -hmm. because if you're printing T-shirts and you're doing doing DVDs and Blu-rays and all this stuff, in the end, your expenses may be more than half of what you actually exactly. raise. Then Kickstarter gets their cut, Amazon gets their yeah. cut, you know. Credit cards. Yeah, it's <laughs> like yeah, you lose a lot of that <laughs> yeah. money. So coming up with ways to give people, um, you know, their, their uh, backer uh, rewards that don't involve physical product is a big deal. And like the exclusive thing is tough, but what you can do is, you know, you make some content exclusive, not all content. Yeah. So you have a production blog that's behind the scenes, and yeah, people may torrent it and share it, but if you're pro unless your project is super high profile, it's probably not gonna happen. But the, so you don't have to worry about protecting it as much. The you know? thing that, I mean, the thing that you need to have is, I mean, you treat it like a pre-sale. It's yeah. a pre-sale to whatever you're gonna end up with. And in order to have a successful pre-sale, you need an audience. And yes, you could first. get lucky yeah. and not have an audience and have a hit project, but that's luck. You don't want to base everything off luck. Well, it was easy for Ver Veronica Mars because they, they had an audience. Built in yeah. audience. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's what you need. And so right now, if you have a small audience, build it as much as possible. Before you know, the project. Before the project, yeah. before yeah. the Kickstarter. That way, everyone that's already a fan, they're waiting with their credit card already 
they're just waiting for you to say. And if give you me don't money. have a specific audience, it helps if you have a niche where the project yeah. fits in. If you have a target group like you guys with the fantasy world, you know, there, there's not yeah. not much fantasy coming out of Austria or Europe in general. So that might be. Yeah, I wouldn't know, even reduce it. Cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even reduce it to to Austria. Uh, but for me, I said, okay, my approach is like I I'd like to do Game of Thrones. That's the most popular series right now. And they also have to work with a relatively low budget. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's, it's fantasy for grown-ups. And I said, okay, uh, if I do Wienerland, <laughs> yeah, um, what every product that they did on, the on Star Wars or on Game of Thrones, or every, I don't know, merchandise thing is something that could maybe pull us away from other short movies who just say, okay, I need $20,000 and you get uh, whatever, producer credit. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll also work with stuff like that, but I, I, want, I want to have my own action figures. I want to have my own board game. He always talks about f action figures. He yeah, loves I action know. figures. Start no, I said, yeah, action we got to have action figures. You should have that before the, the series. Money for them, but let's and even if I have figures. to, I don't know, even if I have to paint them on my own. I mean, <laughs> it's, even has to cast it on yeah, his own from yeah, pen. I would. <laughs> yeah, but the action figures would yeah. be cool. And, and that's also, um, so uh, that's, Part of our plan is, is the merchandising, of course, yeah. because if you have fantasy fans and they are, I don't know, live action role play players, um, they love little stuff. And yeah. if you have quality stuff, it could be a poster. Yeah. Then, okay, let's start with posters. Then we, I mean, of course, it's, then again, if, that's why he shakes his head when I say $150,000, because it's not just shooting. Yeah. You lose like 10 to 15%. Um, and then we also have produced action figures. So maybe we have, in the beginning, we have, to find a way to offer something that we might be able to create on our own yeah. that's extra Or you hours. have other people create it for you. So you get yeah. someone that's yeah. known to yeah. make the trinkets. You get a famous artist to make those trinkets. Yeah. Or you get a f the person who did the Star Wars poster to do your poster. And then so you're s the limited edition po yeah. poster. But I think Rue is right. I mean, it's, it's like half of the money that it costs. Yeah. I, I know from own experience, I was involved with a project called Homophobia, a short film. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gregor, the director, he's quite experienced with social media. He had a very successful project before. He also does social media management for you know some some other projects which are not his. And uh, but the advantage of this project is that he had you know he had the gay community behind this thing, and they obviously have a, a big need for you know uh, finding figures who they can ad identify with on screen because there aren't that many films in. Yeah. In, in their world, so uh, that's why they they really support each other, and they're you know these fest different festivals for them and all that kind of stuff. So he funded that project within no time. He only asked I think for six thousand, ended up with ten thousand. He could have I I think he could have asked for ten, you know three times more, and it would have been yeah. easily done. Mm -hmm. I mean now the film has like one point six million views on YouTube, mm -hmm. so it's it's extremely extremely success successful. But he spent half of that money on you know all the yeah. all the rewards and tons of time too. and it takes a lot of time i mean <laughs> uh, i think we we finished a project in april uh, last year no two years ago yeah it's like almost is it two years ago no it was one year ago anyway um one year later he shipped the last rewards because it took him so long to produce everything he did it really he wanted it the way you know he planned it for and it should be exactly how he planned it but it takes some time and it takes a lot of work and your own time is worth money as well yeah. but usually you, do, you can't charge anyone for and that kickstarter you know? wasn't actually made to be used the way it is right now their initial goals weren't for it to be people buying things you know it was a way for you to fund cool projects and the reward system was set up so there could be cool rewards but it wasn't supposed to like you know the pebble watch became yeah. you just buy the pebble watch right and so many kickstarters right now you're just pre-buying pre something yeah process. it's a pre-sale but that wasn't really the original intent from my understanding like the the rewards were meant to be you know things that are a little bit less of a physical thing you know especially when it comes to a film project you know yeah blu-ray that makes sense that people will pay a certain amount of money but that's going to cost you a lot of your money and what you want is a project that people are so behind and they are so into it that what they are doing is giving you money so they can see that thing yeah right whatever it is that you're making so and that they can the see it and not so that they can get a t-shirt about it yeah. you know the t-shirts are fun and all that stuff but if if you really have to have those kinds of rewards in order to get your to get people to to fund it 
then you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're not selling what you really want to make, project. which is the project. Yeah. Yeah. And it should be that people are funding it so they can see it, not so they can own, you know, some some kind of toy or action figure, which that sounds totally cool. <laughs> but, we that, have, you know. Uh, <laughs> it, makes it makes it easier. It makes yeah. it easier it's to spend a little more money, I guess. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah it, it is easier to it's spend a little more money, upsell. but then you the lose upsell that money. process is, right? yeah. But would you, would you start I mean, as I said, we probably need at least $150,000 to yes. do it. Um, I also thought about maybe starting at $50,000 uh, and, and shoot just two episodes mm -hmm. and get it out there. Would you recommend setting your, your target higher or, or, no. or start low? The, or? the big thing right now that people are doing, because you know, if you don't fund your Kickstarter, you get nothing, right? So. Uh, one one of the big things that you can see if you and if you go and I think Kickstarter has this whole tutorial you know they yeah. they kind of tell you how to do it. using stretch goals as a way to get what you really want mm -hmm. but knowing that you can still fall back and make something really cool it may not be your dream project so you set a fifty thousand dollar target and you're you're the true goal of the project right like this is what it is if you hit fifty grand we will be able to make three episodes right and that is it but you have stretch goals if we hit a hundred thousand then we're able to make six episodes. If we hit 150, then we're able to make an entire series. If we hit 200, you, you want at least one stretch goal past your dream. If we hit 200, we can do this, you know? And so with all of that stuff, then you can at least get that project funded. And you can at least go out and shoot these episodes, which will lead to hopefully running another Kickstarter campaign. Now you're even more eyes on it, even more successful. You've teased people with these three episodes, and they're much more likely to fund future ones. I think it's it's also about you know realistic expectations, yeah. and um, psychologically, it's better to yeah. start with a lower yeah. lower. Also, I mean, people you know think you're just completely out of your mind if you ask for one hundred fifty thousand right <laughs> away without any track record in that. But one hundred and fifty thousand of, of usable money is almost three hundred thousand dollars to actually ask <laughs> yeah, for. It's yeah. true. <laughs> it's true. So I think the stretch goal concept concept really works well. It allows you to prove yourself. It still gets you into the project that you want and you're building your audience at the same time. And so it's, a, it's kind of a safer way to do it than just asking for the full amount. Also, people have no idea how much projects cost. So like what you said, you know, 150,000 sounds like a ton of money. You can do anything with that. When in reality, we know that you can only go so far with that money. But like, it's hard to ask people for a lot of money when they look at their own salary and what they do and how they live their life. So I think that starting with a small goal with stretch goals is a good way to do it. And maybe you'll hit the stretch, you know? Yeah. And and people, what they'll do is they'll help you fund to get to your 50,000, but when they want something to succeed, they will be more likely to spread it. Mm -hmm. So even if it hits the 50,000, they'll be tweeting about it, posting on their own social media, saying, hey, I want the full season to exist. So I'm gonna try to get all my friends to fund this. I don't wanna see just three episodes. And that helps to fund it as well, by having them be your sales force so that you're not doing all of the external media by yourself. W will you provide outlines for the individual episodes to backers? You know, uh, just to what to expect mm, from yeah. there? And I'm not giving everything away, but... No, 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 but I not. actually <laughs> have an outline that could last for four or five seasons right now. And what I thought of as, as a stretch goal, I don't know, after season one, there could be a huge battle somewhere up in Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that By could be way, a stretch goal, because if I can't shoot, if, if, I, if I get the money, I can shoot the whole battle scene. If I don't yeah. get it, you'll go the Game of Thrones route and, oh, he, somebody hit my head. And, uh, <laughs> I woke up, did I miss anything? Oh. <laughs> but yeah, it, and yeah. people will understand, because that's why I uh, think that transparency and, and the behind the scenes look is so important. Mm -hmm. Because if I just tell them, okay, look, I wanted to shoot the battle scene, but I just couldn't afford it, yeah. they will understand. So maybe we can do it in season two. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think the most important factor is transparency and, and being honest and staying honest. Yeah. yeah. One other thing I think we shouldn't forget in Austria and some other European countries is the law situation with taxes. The problem, mm -hmm. the problem being you get money if you are successful. Let's say you get the 150,000. Yeah. You'll have to pay for tax for that. Yeah. <laughs> that means if you don't spend the money in the same year, you will have to pay income tax for that. Uh, so I have to pay 75 grand. Yeah. So it's basically like 50% <laughs> at, you know. Hey, I live in Stockholm. I know about yeah. taxes. 
So <laughs> that is, the, yeah, exactly. I mean, Sweden is a good example. Yeah, but as soon as we get the money, we start shooting it. We'll be so you'll next. use it. If you well, don't it. worry, guys. Yeah. No, yeah, but it, it's it. also a timing issue. For example, so yeah. if you run the campaign in end of the year, end yeah. of this year, I know. It'd be you dangerous. Know, it's yeah. just the, yeah. this. I mean, I, I originally I wanted to show the teaser before Christmas and start the campaign in the, I don't know, March. Mm -hmm. Now, our premiere is April 30th, yeah. so it took us six months to do seven minutes. Um, I still think that we could start shooting in, in f this fall, but my plan B is to maybe shoot another teaser, which could also be part of the whole thing, um, and then start the campaign in September, October. Or maybe we find, in, and that's another thing that I'm, I was thinking about, if, you, if we find investors, then I, for me that rules out the Kickstarter campaign, because yeah. if I already get the money and then I keep asking for more money, then that just doesn't work for me. So it's either or. Well, well it depends. I mean, there are a lot of projects on Kickstarter which you know, just are started, they have shot like 80%. And they just need a little bit to finish yeah. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or they just need money to do post. Yeah, yeah, but I, no, to make it better. Yeah. But yeah. I, I don't like that. If I see a project like, okay, look, we already shot everything. And now we just need 25 grand to do our Sound. distribution. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not backing those projects. It depends. I mean, I would yeah. judge that on an individual basis, to be honest. I mean, I have seen yeah. one and the other. Uh, yeah, that's true. Very often there are some, you know, like missing some scenes. They just really ran out of money. And suddenly that actor that they had they, with, with whom they shot like two years ago is suddenly a big star and he wants money, but they still need to shoot two scenes with him. I saw that, yeah. you know, and yeah. The problem with is investors is when, you ha when you're crowdfunding, it's very clear what you need to give back, right? Like you either ha you have your rewards and you have the project itself. And investors need one more level. They want their money back, right? Yeah. They want their money back plus, okay? So the responsibility that you have if you take individual investors, um, that's, that's a lot higher of a responsibility. And if your project doesn't deliver to a certain level, that puts you in the hole, right? Whereas with crowdfunding, people know what they're getting out of it. They're not hoping to make back their money. They're, they have given you that money. They may get a reward, but it's then- a, It's a donation, yeah. basically. It's right? a donation. Yeah. And, you know, and that's what it should be. That's why the rewards thing, I'm, a less, I'm less for the physical rewards because it should be a donation. Um, but an investor, it's not a donation, right? They may want to see the project. They may be just as passionate about it, but they also want to get their money back plus a certain percentage for their investment. And so that puts a lot more pressure on you. And if things are falling through and you can't deliver the same thing that you wanted with the budget that you received from them, you're responsible for that, right? Now, whereas if you crowdfund a campaign and you say, okay, we're gonna do these 10 episodes and all of this, and it turns out, you know, the budget's a little tight and you were, you, you had to kind of cut things a little and then you delivered nine episodes instead, your, your people are probably gonna still be happy with you. Yeah. But if nine episodes wasn't able to fund, you know, paying back an investor, you, you're in trouble. It's yeah. true. I mean, that's also the problem of Kickstarter that, you know, a lot of people who buy products there uh, who never get them or oh, yeah, that's wait, happened to me. wait for ages. Yeah. 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 It's been years. Uh, I won't name it because I don't want to <laughs> call anywhere. But we're, we're still waiting for things that I paid for years ago. Filmmaker yeah. projects, you know, like yeah. cool little devices and stuff. And, you know, I, it's almost always because people underestimate the amount of money they really need to make a project yeah. successful. And they, they overestimate the amount of that, that big dollar number they see, whether it's 100 grand or five grand. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, 100 grand, I can do this. And then when they actually get it in their account and it's now 70, they're like, whoa, I don't, I don't know if I can do this. You know, like, it's a big difference. People have to, the, the planning, they're so excited about what they're doing Especially that with, they leave out planning. With, with products, a lot of people who just have a cool idea, but they have no clue how to, yeah. you know, how to, it's their how first to make thing, it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's one thing to have a cool idea. It's another thing to make it reality. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's people asking for money without really knowing what to do with it very often. And that's, uh, that's the problem. What kind of makes it bad reputation-wise mm -hmm. for some other projects. So. It, it does, it does. And manufacturing is a whole nother world. Mm -hmm. You know, being an inventor and being a, a manufacturer are two very different things. And the super successful campaigns like Pebble or those big ones, yeah, then they can hire people to do all the business for them, right? But if your campaign is smaller, it's really hard to deliver when you've never done something before. You don't understand how to build efficient workflows and you don't un understand like how to use that money wisely. That also works in yeah, film production as well. But those show in the 
actual layout and the production that they put into the Kickstarter. Yes. You can kind of tell now. You can. If it's going to get done. Because it's been done so many times. But I think a lot of great things could exist if people only put a little more effort into it. Like, they have a great idea, yeah. but they, they're not good at presenting it. That's why it goes back again to building an audience first so that they're excited about it before you're ever asking for anything. Yeah. Cool. I think we should wrap it up there. How Thanks, long? guys. That was a, that was a <laughs> great discussion. <laughs> thanks for your time and thanks for everything and good luck with your project. Thank you. Uh, yes. We'll support it as good as we can. I will, yes. I will help much. fund it and I want an action. Oh, you just have to like the <laughs> Facebook page. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> that. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Nina, for having us. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks for having thanks. us. That was another episode of Cinema 5D on the couch. We thank our sponsors, our investors, so to say. That's <laughs> B&H, uh, who supplied all the equipment we use here. Uh, Zeiss, Vitek Videocom and Tools on Air. Thank you and see you on another episode of On the Couch. <laughs>